Okay, thank you everybody so much for coming this morning. I'm Lucy Birmingham, the president of the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. We are very, very honored today to have our, as our guest speakers, Sir Philip Craven, president of the International Paralympic Committee, and Mr. Yasushi Yamakawa, uh, Yamawaki, uh, Yamawaki-san, president of the Japanese Paralympic Committee. Um, I wanted to briefly introduce Sir Craven, but in fact, it's actually very difficult to do that because his list of accomplishments are so vast. He's a five-time Paralympian in wheelchair basketball. He's won gold, silver, and bronze medals at numerous world championships. He's also played a key role in establishing and promoting Paralympic sport. But the best way, I think, to really understand his accomplishments is to watch a Paralympic wheelchair game or any Paralympic competition. You can see the incredible drive, the strength, and the heroism of the players. It's simply awesome. Yamawaki-san is a senior executive at NYK Lines, one of Japan's leading shipping companies, along with his post as president of the Japanese Paralympic Committee. He is also vice president of the Tokyo Organizing Committee of the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So for our format today, uh, Sir Craven will speak first and then show a five-minute video about the history of the Paralympic movement. Yama Wakisan will then speak about the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. He'll also show a short video about the future of the Paralympic movement. We'll then have about a 30-minute Q&A session, and we'll finish at 11.30. So please give a warm welcome to Sir Philip Craven and Mr. Yasushi Yamawaki-san. Thank you very, thank you very much, Lucy. Um, and also with us, we have the Vice President of the International Paralympic Committee, Andrew Parsons from Brazil, who is also uh, President of the Brazilian Paralympic Committee and the Chief Executive Officer of the International Paralympic Committee, Javier Gonzalez, who by his name you can probably tell is, well, he's Catalan actually, but he's also Spanish. So, uh, <laughs> Um, now, normally, uh, when I speak, uh, I, I prefer to talk about the philosophy and the values and what drives Paralympians. But um, I've been asked this morning uh, and been given some notes by our director of communications, and I'm giving out more information, as this is the first time that we've been uh, we've been together, and this will not be the last time, I can assure you, but, um, but then maybe in questions and answers we can talk a little bit more about, uh, about the philosophy and the values. So, the Paralympic movement, well, it started uh, in Stoke Mandeville, which is about 40 miles to the northwest of London, and this was a spinal injuries unit set up, uh, really, to look after the great number of injured soldiers that would be coming back once the D-Day landings had started in 1944. And, uh, and appointed to lead this was a man called Dr. Ludwig Gutmann, um, a German uh, who'd in fact escaped Hitler uh, before the war and, uh, and then uh, was asked by the British government to, to do this. And he, or others, and he adopted their ideas, had the idea to use sport in rehabilitation. And so the games came out of, and the, and the practice of sport came out of this rehabilitation process. The first international games were at Stoke Mandeville in 1952, so we're talking about something that's over 60 years old. And um, the first actual uh, games that we now term the Paralympic Games uh, were in Rome in 1960, and they followed on from the Olympics. And that set, it, set a, uh, a trend. And of course, the second Paralympic Games were here in Tokyo in 64, following on from the Olympics. And, uh, and in, uh, in Rome, there were 400 athletes from 23 countries. And soldiers were on hand in Rome to carry para-athletes up the stairs to the accommodation. So there was no accessibility, nothing, that wasn't thought about. The key thing was to get the, get the games moving. 
in Tokyo, as I said, in, in 64, and then, of course, in 2020, Tokyo will be the first city to stage the Paralympic Games twice. And what we're also delighted about is that so much effort has been put into celebrating this 50th anniversary since those games took place uh, in 1964, both the Olympics and the Paralympics. If we look to the Winter Games, the Paralympic Winter Games, they started in Sweden in 1976. I don't know if there are any Swedes in the room, but I'll try and pronounce the name of the town called Ernskjöldsvik. I know it's wrong, by the way, but I've made, made my best efforts there. And they were started by three pioneering uh, Nordic men who said, we are going to stage the Paralympic Winter Games, and they did it. You'll find that Paralympians are fighters. Par Paralympians and people involved in our movement, if we believe we've got to do something, we do it, and we do it against the odds if we have to. Barcelona in 1992 really were landmark games. This was the first time that crowds came out, massive numbers of spectators, probably difficult to, to judge, but probably very near to a million spectators in, uh, in Barcelona in 1992. And this was the first time there was TV coverage, and, uh, and it really showed us all the potential for the Paralympic Games. Much of that potential was realized in Sydney in 2000, when the Paralympics benefited out from outstanding levels of competition, <clears throat> organization, and public awareness. Ticket sales broke the million uh, barrier for the first time, and the games were shown live on the internet for the first time to over 100 countries. So already, the internet was being used by the Paralympic Games back in, in the year 2000. I'd like to now just tell you a little bit about uh, the tremendous relationship that we have with the International Olympic Committee. This started in the year 2000 when the then President Samaranj before he finished as president of the IOC, was absolutely insistent that there should be uh, a direct connection between the Olympics and the Paralympics. And, uh, and the, f the previous president of IPC signed a document in 2000, which was the start of our relationship. This relationship has really developed uh, under Jacques Rogg as the, as the president from 2000 and, uh, 2001 until 2013. And in 2012, instead of a cooperation agreement, we signed a partnership agreement with the, I, with the IOC, which is significant. Partnerships, that's where each partner contributes to the whole and the development of a movement or two movements the Olympics and the Paralympics. And the Olympics and the Paralympics come together in one great festival of sport. That's what happened in London, that's what happened in Sochi uh, earlier this year, and that's what will happen here in Tokyo in 2020. Since the new president of the IOC, Thomas Bach, took over, our relationship has accelerated even further. We have a, a deepening, widening, uh, and even more, um, I would say, uh, life lively relationship with the, with the International Olympic Committee. Very, very positive indeed. Beijing 2008 is when the world really started to take notice of the Paralympic Games. The Games were sensational on many levels, spectacular ceremonies, great sport, but one of the standout features was the impact of the Games and how that had an impact on Chinese society. It was really transformational. New legislation was passed on the building of accessible facilities, and investment combined with the performances of the para-athletes helped transform Chinese perceptions of people with an impairment, who up until 2008 had been excluded from society. Official post-Games report it said that before the Games, a person with an impairment would be a beggar on the street. After the games, they would be viewed as a long jumper, a wheelchair basketball player, or a footballer. Those games in Beijing had such an effect on Lord Ko, on Sebastian Ko, the chairman of the organizing committee for London, that 
he really realized there and then that London Paralympics were going to be really big time. He came back from there. I had dinner with him in October 2008. And he didn't sit down for about a minute and a half talking about 90,000 spectators in the bird's nest watching para-athletics. Amazing. And so those, that inspirational time in Beijing led to definitely the greatest Paralympic Summer Games ever in London. There were 4,237 athletes from 164 countries. Ticket sales, 2.78 million sold for the 20 sports and for the two ceremonies. Broadcast to 120 countries, drawing a cumulative audience of 3.8 billion. The games again created seismic shifts in attitudes and perceptions. Many people said to me before the games, the UK doesn't need this. I said, you must be kidding. The UK does need this transformational aspect where people, where Paralympians are seen as great athletes and not athletes with a disability. Then we moved on to Sochi this year, 20, uh, 2014 in March, again following on from the Olympics. They were again groundbreaking for the Winter Games. The most viewed Winter Paralympics ever, an audience of 2.1, cumulative audience of 2.1 billion. The barrier-free environment was the key thing for the Russian government that was put in place in Sochi, and now that is being put throughout the country, the vast country of Russia. And there was great coverage of the games in Japan through NHK and Sky Perfect TV. Japan did very well, by the way, in the medals table. And so, uh, you know, uh, the people of Japan saw probably winter sport for the first time. Where are we now? You know, if we've just finished with the Sochi Games. Well, the Paralympic Games is the third biggest sporting event in the world, if you look at ticket sales. Only the Olympics and the FIFA World Cup sells more tickets than the Paralympic Games. As the Games have grown in size and scale, so has their impact on society. No other sporting event in the world can change attitudes and perceptions quite like the Paralympic Games. They're a fantastic showcase for high performance sport and an event that can act as a catalyst for a more inclusive society. The IPC, as I, did I say it or did I not? We, no, I said it to you. We celebrated 25 years. This is the International Paralympic Committee, 25 years in Berlin 10 days ago. And we were so delighted to receive a video message from Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. But it, the words that he used, the key words, were words of a Paralympian, Mami Sato. And he talked of uh, what he, in fact, reiterated the words that Mami Sato had said about the Paralympic movement. The movement now boasts over 200 members and is growing all the time. Very briefly about the future, Rio 2016, I've already said the vice president is from, is from Brazil. And this is an, an opportunity to bring para-sport to the whole of the Americas, a territory in terms of TV audiences and participation that offers massive potential. The games will be ready, we can assure you of that. And the Carioca, who are the people of Rio, will ensure that this is just one big sporting party. If we look to Pyeongchang in 2018, here we're confident we'll have the best ever games from a point of view of technical delivery. In Sochi, nearly half of all gold medalists were aged 23 and under. The talent will be even stronger in four years' time. And then what of Tokyo 2020? Well, I know that Yama will talk more about that. But um, these may, it's been written here, but I can tell you I sense that they will be the games that propel the Paralympic movement to new, unimaginable levels. The commitment and enthusiasm already. Hello there. Didn't see you before. <laughs> And the enthusiasm that the organizing committee has shown so far is infectious, and I'm so excited by what will take place. And I'm also delighted that the Tokyo 2020 Executive Board features a number of people involved in Paralympic sport, of course, including my IPC governing board member, Yasushi Yamawaki. So I think that outlining the aspirations 
for Tokyo 2020. I will leave that to Yama, but already um, I think that we have a job to do here. The Games will be a vehicle to transform perceptions in this great country of <coughs> Japan to the positive. Paralympians don't worry about what doesn't work, they just maximise what does. Those are the words of a great Australian woman wheelchair basketball player, Donna Ritchie. So you don't look at what doesn't work or what's missing, you maximise what's there and you make the most of it. So that's what we're about. I'm not going to say any more now, I'm going to hand over, well we're going to see a video, we're going to see a video a little bit on the history of the, uh, of the Paralympic movement and then Yama will say some words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Inspiring and exciting the world with elite sport, the Paralympic Games have grown into the third largest sporting event in the world. Transformed from a disability movement to one with sport at its core, para-athletes create a more inclusive society and inspire the world to believe that anything is possible. Your performances will inspire and excite the world. You will not just inspire a generation, but many generations to come. The Paralympic movement started with the vision of one man, Sir Ludwig Gutmann. Beginning in 1948 with an archery competition for injured service personnel in Stoke Mandeville, England, it grew into the Paralympic Games. Increasing commercial support and growing media coverage, athletes now compete in world-class venues, in front of sold-out crowds and billions of TV viewers. Every time I go to sleep, I dream that I can still see. And then, you know, I wake up through the dark, and that's tough. It's a crucial aspect of rehab to find something to motivate you and experience relevance, and sport is a great way to make that happen. I love the feeling in slalom, in downhill, the feeling of speed. When I'm ski, I'm free. People finally and knowledge that behind Alex Zanardi there are an incredible amount of fantastic athletes who work really, really hard to realize their dreams. Embracing social media like no other, athletes are giving unique insights into what it's like to be a proud Paralympian. Away from the Paralympics, the movement is bursting with sport. On average, a major international or regional sporting event takes place every two weeks, whilst regional multi-sport events are providing the perfect stepping stone to the Paralympic Games. Athletes are also becoming household names, recognized for their stunning performances. By displaying the Paralympic values of courage, determination, inspiration and equality, athletes are creating seismic shifts in attitudes towards people with an impairment. We are equally equal to other people. We are equal to each and every one. We have equal values. We can do everything we want. That's equality. Through the Ajitos Foundation, the IPC aims to develop sport opportunities for all. No other movement drives social inclusion through the incredible abilities of athletes. Through sport, athletes challenge the way people think about themselves, 
and how they think about others, leaving tangible legacies. We will never think of sport the same way, and we will never think of disability the same way. enabling athletes to achieve sporting excellence, the Paralympic movement will continue to inspire and excite the world. Together, we are spreading a message of respect and equal opportunity for all individuals. So that's just a little intro. Uh, you'll see a video about the future uh, after you've heard from uh, Yasushi Yamawaki. Okay, thank you, Lucy. No, no, yeah. Thank you, Philip. Good morning. It's a, it's a great movie, and uh, that show everything all about its uh, ability and Olympics. And also, Philip already told almost everything, you know, I have to say, so it is very oh. difficult, but uh, it's, uh, I, I, uh, you know, it's, uh, I've been uh, a frequent visitor of this uh, dining room and sushi bar for many years, and, uh, but uh, today is uh, uh, a little bit different. It is my uh, great honor to come here to speak to you in this morning. So I would like to talk about it's what uh, uh, Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games can do for this country. As uh, uh, Philip mentioned, uh, sir, we have just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Tokyo 1964 Olympic and Paralympic Games. It was a second Paralympic and using Paralympic name in the first time in Tokyo. Since then, the Paralympic Games has transformed into the world third biggest sporting event. Number one is Olympic, and the second, the FIFA World Cup, and third is Paralympic. Uh, and with a strong track record for driving social exclusion. The games that will come here in 2020 will be very different to those that we hosted 50 years ago. Back in 1964, 375 athletes from 21 countries took part, whilst in six years' time, around 4,500 high-performance athletes from 170 countries will be in Tokyo when it become the first city ever to stage the Paralympic game for a second time. We are very proud of it. From a sporting viewpoint, the games present a huge opportunity to get more people active in palace sports and <clears throat> uh, uh, get more active in palace sport at all level, from the grassroots right through to the elite level. Apart from the obvious health benefit, any sport participation brings getting more people involved at the gross loose level is the only way we are going to develop more top class Paralympians in this country. And it is vital that Japan does well at Tokyo 2020, as previous games has shown that a strong home nation is key to successful games. At London 2012, Team Japan finished 24th in the middle table. We need to do better in six years' time. And we have set a target for Tokyo 2020, placing sevens in terms of the number of the gold medal. I know it is a very ambitious target. Am I confident? Yes, I am. Uh, 
I'd like to talk about uh, our in incredible uh, Paralympians uh, in wheelchair tennis. Uh, I'm not talking about Kei Nishikori in uh, tennis player. Uh, I'm talking about Shingo Kunieda and Yui Kamiji. Uh, we currently boost the world number one ranked players uh, in men's and women's game. Uh, uh, Kunieda and Kamiji are both Grand Slammer of this year in wheelchair tennis. And also following Mami Sato's presentation at the IOC session last September, awareness of palace sports in this country has risen to a new level. Paralympic champions are not created overnight. They are developed over time, and Japanese Paralympic Committee hope the programs will, will implement to develop athlete pathway between now and 2020 will have the desired level. Uh, from 18th, starting from this Saturday, Asian Pala Games uh, will be held in uh, uh, Incheon, we have 285 Japanese athletes will participate in that games. So you will see lots of Japanese new stars, new heroes, heroines participating in uh, uh, Incheon Japan Parlor games. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we will look see that uh, uh, wonderful athletes. Uh, last Tuesday, I was a part of the IPC governing board meeting in Berlin to deciding which Pala Sports should be part of the Tokyo 2020 Pala Sports program. 24 sports apply to be a part of games, and also we can have a maximum of 23 sports. Our aim is to ensure that Tokyo 2020 showcases the best of what Pala Sports has to offer. If this means we have less than 23 sports, then so be it. Last week, we approved the inclusion of 16 sports, including Pala Badminton, which will make its Paralympic Games program in six years' time in Tokyo 2020 here. For the eight sports, Still in the learning, we identified a number of issues with their submissions. The IPC governing board will evaluate these application when it meet in Abu Dhabi next January, and will make a final decision on of the number of sports and which sports will be included in Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Sports Program. As with any game legacies, is always a hot topic. More people practicing pala sports and a strong Japanese team are clearly tangible legacies of these Tokyo 2020 games, as are the venues, facilities, and infrastructures relating to the games that will be built here. But one legacy the Paralympics will deliver, which very few other sporting events can, is a significant impact on Japanese society. The Tokyo 2020 Paralympics will change social perception and remove the barrier in people's mind towards impairment. I strongly believe that the Paralympics have the power to change a society and create a more equitable and inclusive society. In 2020, one third of the nation's population will be over 65. What happened to a rapidly aging society? We have to help each other. We need an inclusive society. Inclusive means equal opportunities and participation not only for people with an impairment, but also for every 
members of society. The Tokyo 2020 Paralympics will be a kind of gateway to a future society. This is a golden opportunity to leave a legacy which connect to an equitable, comfortable, and inclusive society. This is what the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games mean to this country. To finish, I just want to touch on the law you, the med media broadcasters, and uh, <clears throat> uh, commercial partners can have on the games. As with any games, you are instrumental in its success, but with the Paralympic, you can be instrumental in helping to change the lives of millions of people. The Paralympic game is a high performance sports event featuring athletes management feats you never ever thought possible as you see that video. For many of you, the Paralympics will be new territory, so if there is anything the IPC, the Japanese Paralympic Committee, or Tokyo 2020 can do to assist in your coverage, then please let us know. Finally, I'm confident Tokyo 2020 will deliver the best ever Paralympic Games, and we look forward to working with you over the next six years. So please join us, come to meet incredible athletes, see the amazing games, and feel it, so you will be inspired. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yamaha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've got now another short video to show. The practice of sport can do a lot for society. The world needs to realize the value of individuals practicing sport, and in particular, Paralympic sport. I swim like six times a week. It's fun. It keeps me fit and it gives me a chance to be like anybody else, really. Paralympic sport gives people who may not see themselves as having a great future, realizing that they do have a great future. And so it's great to see that young people are starting to discover what the world of Paralympic sport can do for them. It's going to be Peacock getting the goal. When I was a kid, I was just sport mad. Everything that all the other kids wanted to do, I wanted to do. We wanted to encourage him to just fulfill his potential like any parent does for their child. And when London 2012 came around, it really inspired him to get involved in sport. I want to be like Tony Peacock. <laughs> it's fantastic to see that. And once he got a really good blade and he could just run around, it just gave him that, that freedom that he didn't have before. And I think that's the most important thing for kids. It's not about you know trying to push them in and, and become the next Paralympic champion. It's just about getting them active. You know? Developing new talent and working with young people is extremely important because they're the athletes who will compete at the Paralympics of tomorrow. Molly Van Ryan, this is a real surprise. When I was a child, I definitely didn't think that I would be this Paralympic champion. I didn't really know that it would come this far. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Molly Van Ryan is very inspirational to me because she's got the same disability. One day I'll definitely be as successful as Molly. Oh, wow! It's so cool to see that the young children will also, you know, follow these footsteps. That was a really fast one. If there's one thing I would like to ask, it's calling on to the athletes of today to become the leaders of tomorrow. It's important to design your own destiny. We must remain athlete-centered, but the way we can do that is more and more athletes getting involved in the future of IPC. Rio 2016, that's a big goal for me. My ambition is Paralympics 2018 in Pyeongchang. I really want to get to the Paralympics. I want to be a Paralympic champion.
the movement is everybody out there in the world, you know, whether that's members of the International Paralympic Committee, whether that's fans. I think one of the greatest thrills is interacting with volunteers. This movement is growing and moving forward. We're not going to take over the planet, by the way, but some people might say we've come a long way, but really what's past is gone. I'm looking forward to the future. So inspirational. <laughs> okay, so um, now we're going to open the floor up to um, Q and A. The press gets the first dibs. Anybody have a question among the press? Yes, please, Fred. Uh, Fred Varko, freelance. Um, plenty of questions here. Um, first of all, maybe I could address to Sir Philip. Um, and to Yamawachi-san is about um, accessibility in Tokyo at the moment. Um, how do you find Tokyo in terms of accessibility for disabled people? Um, and and Yamawachi-san, you, you mentioned about how you want to encourage people to be Paralympians for 2020. Um, it, are there opportunities enough for ordinary people to ordinary disabled people to become Paralympians uh, in Tokyo. Is Tokyo doing enough to encourage these people? Yep, yeah, sure. Of course, uh, I've been in Tokyo two days, and uh, I've been staying in a quite a nice hotel, and been to different uh, office buildings. Uh, what I have to say is, for me, it's been very easy to get around, um, and I think. What we need to also realize is that what may be suitable for myself as a wheelchair user would be very different for somebody with a visual impairment. So what we don't use is the term disability, the disabled, because somebody who's blind, I've been told this by blind people, prefer to use steps rather than a ramp. And therefore a ramp is suitable for wheelchairs, but it's not suitable for steps. And I think that... Um, so that I cannot really comment on, on what needs to be done in Tokyo, but in every city that the Paralympic Games comes to, there is massive work to be done to get things accessible for everyone. This is what we talk about for every person. Yama mentioned uh, people getting older, and when he mentions 65, I've only got one year to go to that, and uh, which uh, is a little bit of concern. Um, but really, what the Games can do, it can make everyone realise that they can come out and be part of society outside of the home. Let's not relegate older people to remain in the home. Get them out there, get them enjoying life as long as they possibly can. There's work to do, but I know that the Governor has made an absolute commitment, the Governor of Tokyo has made an absolute commitment to have an accessible environment for everyone with the games coming. Don't start saying six years out, well, this isn't right. And Well, please do say this isn't right, this isn't right. But then we've got six years to work at. And really, the, the games is this vehicle that accelerates everything. It's particularly in legacy format after the games that you'll see continuing improvement to the city. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. It's a, uh, I understand your question how to encourage pe people uh, with an impairment to be inactive in the para sports or in the Olympic. Uh, we have a, a several program. You, you know, so one of the program uh, are for recruiting more young, you know, people or are finding out actually. It's a, we, we just started the recruiting program. We, we are, uh, uh, had the two program in, in Tokyo and Kobe, and uh, 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 they're asking Olympians come here to have a kind of a, uh, 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 show their what their uh, palace sports or what the Olympians doing. It's, it's all together like 200 people, young people, and join that the program and find it out what's going to be my year 
you know, sports to uh, participate. So uh, we're going to find it out. Some of them, them, I really hope, you know, some of them among the 200 will be Olympian in two, 2020. For their, for their athletes, they are actively participating in their Paralympic or World Cup or, or any other, uh, uh, you know, high performance game. Uh, we establish high performance pl program backed by your uh, government because uh, uh, at your uh, effective April 1st in the, this year, it's a Paralympic and Pala sports uh, uh, jurisdiction. It used to be a, a welfare ministry, you know, it's a, uh, uh, handle all their Pala sports, but uh, effective April 1st uh, this year, it's a sports minister that uh, is in charge. So uh, uh, um, this is a wonderful, it's a, it's a, because this is a one of the already legacy when we got Tokyo 2020, so the palace sports of that year come into the sports as well as Olympics. So we're, we're gonna have a high performance uh, uh, training program as, uh, uh, as Olympic has right now. And for instance, we, we have a national training center in the Nishigaoka, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, specifically designed for the Olympians for training. They, that's a very successful training. But uh, now that open to the Pala uh, athletes, so they can use uh, uh, that uh, high performance, uh, 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 you know, at your, uh, uh, programs and facilities. So that facility will be expanded uh, within the three years. So that new facility is uh, uh, also can be used for Pala athletes. So. Uh, uh, and also, we need a public awareness uh, of the palace sports. Uh, uh, you know, after the Tokyo 2020, as a palace, as I said, because like a superstar, Shingo Kuniedo, Kamiji, or Mami Sato, people knows more about palace sport, interested in, but still, compared to the other sports, Olympics, it's awareness, public awareness of, of Paralympics is very, very low. So we need to encourage medias as you are I'm asking you help to uh, uh, have a more Paralympic uh, uh, issue article to uh, increase public awareness so that many people to see uh, uh, the uh, their palace sports and that encourage athletes or uh, athletes uh, uh, young people with an impairment to become a Pala athletes and Paralympian that uh, we are doing right now. Sorry, my, my, maybe my question wasn't exactly clear. That, that's a very useful answer, but I, I was wondering what you, what's going to be done at grassroots level, so that somebody now who's maybe 12 years old can think about the Olympics when they're 18. You've got your 30 years strategic mm -hmm. plan. 30 years strategic yeah, 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 yeah. plan. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, we after we join uh, uh, Japanese Parliament Committee uh, uh, three years ago, I'm quite new. It's a, I, I've been coming from a, a business community. So we're, uh, uh, we set up a vision uh, and looking for 2030. So we're, that includes, you know, it's an ultimate, uh, uh, it's a per ultimate goal of our vision is, as I said, it's uh, establishing, you know, it's an inclusive society through uh, sports and palace sports. So uh, uh, through that uh, vision, uh, uh, we have many programs, it's, uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, and uh, uh, we will do a making action plan, we uh, uh, will uh, realize that uh, action plan step by step. But, but his predecessor as president, Tore Harasan, he came to my home uh, to, to show me this, um, this uh, strategic plan moving through to 2030. And one of the things that was very exciting for me was the training of local 
coaches so that so that this this was not something that was only happening in if I may say Tokyo yeah, and Kobe yeah. but was happening in each of the 47 prefectures mm -hmm. and this is this is the intention yeah that's a great question um, I are you with the press no press no cut this Thank you. I'm um, Wakakoyuki from Yomiuri Shimbun. Sorry for my late um, arrival. I, my sleepy head took me to Japan Press Center instead. Um, two questions, if I may, Sir Philip. One, you're the hater of D words yeah. and fighter. Now, Unfortunately, I still see a lot of um, um, translation of the disability yeah. in Japanese media as well, as well unfortunately, in the um, names of a lot of sports organizations uh, because of the tradition. And, well, you just signed a, a long-term contract with Panasonic. That means I'm an indicator of um, um, value of Paralympic Games and society is coming up in Japan, I hope. And what do you think is the way a society should take to eliminate such D words and how the fight could be won. Second question. I've spoken to some of the um, political uh, figures in Japan. They say, well, uh, we appreciate the value of Paralympic Games and its eliteness. Let's merge it to the Olympic Games. Now, um, in my personal view, it's impractical because of size, as well as the value of Paralympic Games might be overshadowed. Uh, what is your view, President? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I, I have been quoted many times as saying, let's get rid of the D word, disability. Um, drop it. Don't replace it. Drop it from a great height. Why is that? Because the word disability, if you put that to a, an engine, if something is disabled, it doesn't work. And therefore, in the mentality of the people, a disabled person doesn't function. If you look at it as, a, as an explanatory word rather than a negative word, it's not specific enough. I gave the example of the different requirements if you're, if you're blind or you're or a wheelchair user. No problem in using words such as amputee, such as visually impaired, blind, wheelchair, no problem at all. That's specific. But normally, do you have to use the term? Do you have to say that somebody has an impairment? Normally not. And we're talking athletes. And therefore, this is something that will not happen overnight. This is something that will take time. And this is something that all of us can work at. But we're all individuals of one society. It's not the disabled over here and the rest who are supposedly able, if you take the opposite side of the word, everybody is different. Everybody is an individual, but everybody should be treated for the, for the positive things that they have. As I said at the end of, of when I spoke, um, Paralympians will show the Japanese people that they, they don't have time to worry about what doesn't work. They maximize what does. Now, let's just look at a family, say, in Japan or in Britain or in Brazil, where a member of that family has an accident and they maybe lose a leg, for example. Just an example. It's quite normal that the family is very concerned about that. I would be if my son or my daughter or my two grandsons had, a, had an accident such as that. But eventually, we have to get the family to start thinking about the positive not the gap that's left by no leg, but to see the other leg that works bloody well and the rest of the body that works well, and particularly the heart of the individual and the mind of the individual. Because that would be, for me, the biggest frustration. If I'm walking about one day and everybody knows me as Phil Craven, you know, good guy, good looking guy, you know, when I was 18, I'm not talking about now, uh, necessarily. And, um, but um, now what am I trying to say? I've started getting a big head here. Um, but really, uh, just 
we have to think of the positive and we have to move forward. And that's what Paralympians will do. And it's that transformational nature. It's not looking at the poor disabled. It's looking at great athletes producing great performances. And this is what changes society. The second one about the games, uh, the Paralympic Games uh, joining with the Olympics. I think that uh, already you're aware, I've mentioned the agreement that we have with the, the partnership agreement that we have with the International Olympic Committee. I think there's a tendency when people think this would be a good idea, it's as if the only time that we can really be credible is if we're Olympians and not Paralympians. That's not the case. Paralympians, Olympians, there's no difference. It's all athletes. And the group that gets on most quickly together, when you bring uh, people from Paralympics, people from Olympics together, it's the athletes. They see no difference. It's like young children. Another point about the, coming back to the D word, we talk about reverse education. It's not parents that teach children with regard to uh, everyone being a member of society. It's children that can educate parents. But coming back to the point of the Paralympics being part of the Olympics, you mentioned the word it's impracticable. It's a, it would be a far bigger logistic effort to put them together all at the same time. There'd be a great danger that uh, both in the Olympics and in the Paralympics, some sports would lose events and you wouldn't have a full program. And therefore, we and the International Olympic Committee are absolutely committed to two games, the Paralympics following on from the Olympics and one great festival of sport. And that's the way it is at the moment and that's the way we view it to be at least to, to be on 2020, 2024, 2028, 2050, 2060, who knows? I don't think I'll be around then. But we don't need to be actually in the Olympic Games to have our own credibility. We are what we are. Okay, thank you so much. Did that answer your question? Is that okay? Great, all right. Yes, please, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I'm Misako Imai. I'm a reporter of NHK. Uh, I ask Sir Craven, welcome to Tokyo. Thank you. <laughs> I have two questions. Yep. Um, uh, do you think the number of sports should be increased? And also, could you tell me why you think so? And two, uh, coming six years, uh, what should we do in Japan in order to raise public awareness in Paralympic Games? Thank you. The number of sports, so just to give you a, uh, something that wasn't covered, there are two new sports in Rio in 2016. That's para uh, triathlon and para canoe. So we're moving up from 20 to 22 in Rio. And already we're aware that there's a new sport in Tokyo, which will be para badminton. I think that uh, it's always exciting when there's, a, when there's a new sport coming into the games. It's exciting for the new athletes that will be able to come to the games. But I think also we have to be very, very careful that that sport, and this is why we still have eight sports that are, uh, that are pending to become uh, uh, sports for the Tokyo 2020 program, because at the moment we don't have the guarantees the, the guarantee, for example, their worldwide uh, um, application and participation uh, in a certain number of regions and a certain number of countries, which differs between team sports and individual sports. But, um, but absolutely, but we have to be certain that, this, that this, a new sport coming in is of, uh, of incredibly high quality. And I can tell you that that, was, that is the case with para badminton, and that's why they've already been accepted. Um, coming to your second point, which is about um, what needs to be done over the next six years uh, prior to the Games, and you're from NHK, 
you know, the public uh, public broadcast of both television and and radio. And uh, very very important that we don't just show the games in six in in six years time, um, as Yama said, uh, the media, television, radio. Get to know Paralympians in Japan. Get it out there. Show other events. You'll have a great opportunity uh, from uh, Rio 2016 to show amazing sport for people to really get a flavor for what Paralympic sport is all about in the Paralympic Games. Make sure that that's put as far and wide as it possibly can be. Many of you make sure that you go and go to the Paralympics in Rio. It'll be a great, great event, won't it, Andrew? It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but it will. It'll be amazing. And, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the wonderful effects of moving to different cities, different cultures. If you look at the cities we've been to since, since I've been president, you know, I started off in Salt Lake City, which were incredible winter games in 2002. Then to, then to Greece, then back to northern Italy. Then on to Beijing and China, what an experience that was. Then to Vancouver on the west coast of, uh, of Canada, then back to London, and then into Russia. And what a time we had there in Sochi. So uh, it's, it's a wonderful experience, but please make the most of Rio 2016. And then, of course, the Winter Games in Pyeongchang 2018. Make sure it's across the TV screens. We're confident that that will happen, by the way. And, uh, and that's where the public then become far more aware and they are ready for the games in 2020. Okay, um, we're running out of time. We've got two minutes. Do you want to take another question or sure. wrap it up? Okay, any more questions, anybody? Anybody, anybody besides Fred? <laughs> okay, Why go ahead, yeah, last question. Fred's in again. <laughs> I like asking questions. Um, related to what you were talking about before, about the selection of the sports, um, can you just, this is more of an exp explanatory question, um, can you tell us how you select the sports? Uh, because I think within, well, first question is, do you, is there any kind of mirroring of the IOC sports for the regular Olympics? Uh, second question is, uh, there seem to be a lot more variables within para sports in that people have dis different disabilities. So how does that play into selecting a sport? I, I noticed you're looking at five-a-side football and seven-a-side football, and you have something called goal ball. So how do, you, how do you factor in the varying, I don't want to call them disabilities anymore, but uh, exactly. uh, problems that athletes right. have? Um, yeah. How do you factor that into selection yeah. of the sports? And, and also uh, related to that, how do you classify athletes in terms of what they can do and what they can't do? Okay. I think I think I am I okay to take this? Sure, one? sure. That um, that I think I'll get straight into into that. Uh, you, you brought up particularly uh, there are athletes with there are amputees, there are athletes with visual impairments, and therefore it is very important that there's a good selection of sports. For example, five-a-side football is for blind players. I mean, you saw a guy take a penalty there before. The goalkeeper is sighted. He's not blind, of course, <laughs> but or she. Well, no, it's he. He at the moment. It's just just for men at the moment. But um, but we must have this across across the board. So there, there's the team sport for for the blind in football. There's a team sport in football seven aside for players who've had cer cerebral palsy. Another situation that we take into account is: Does a sport have uh, events for athletes with more severe impairments so that we're not there's a tendency maybe for uh, maybe the media to think oh well a sport that looks very similar to its Ol Olympic equivalent is this is this more easily understood by the by by the public we know from our experiences that that's not the case as long as the public are exposed to the different Paralympic sports before the games they love all the Paralympic sports. Of course, each individual has a, has a, a specific preference. So mirroring the Olympic sports, of course, as you know, many of our sports are also in the Olympic Games. 
but we don't. It's a very. It's a separate selection process. Two different. Two different games, but we do have a very comprehensive uh, selection process, a re-examination process of sports that have been in there already. Uh, quite a, a considerable questionnaire goes out to each of the sports, and they have to respond. So, I'm very happy with the process that we have. Uh, there's more work to be done by eight, by eight sports, as you've said, Yama. Yes. But we're confident that that'll be done by the vast majority before we have our final meeting, which is at the end of end of January. And I've not spoken about classification, which I think would be a very good topic for another time. But I think that I probably need another five or ten minutes to explain that to you. But the basis of classification, where you have uh, you have similar events in one sport is fairness of competition. The competition has to be fair and the, and, the, and the winner with the gold medal has to be the winner with the greatest skill, the greatest determination, the greatest ability, really, and, uh, and not someone who has a physical or a visual advantage over another athlete. Okay, thank you both so much. One of, one of the things that we were talking about earlier, though, was sponsorship. This is yep. like a fantastic opportunity for sponsors to get involved. Uh, you were talking about Panasonic earlier. Are you going after particular sponsors? or Do you want to talk about that? Just really briefly, 30 well, seconds? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that... Uh, that um, you know, you're aware of the IOC's top program for, it, for its sponsors. And we have now, now that we signed with Panasonic yesterday, we have four of those top uh, partners who are also worldwide partners of the, of the Paralympic movement. And that's Visa, that's Samsung, that's Panasonic, and that's Atos. Those are the, those are the four uh, companies so far. We have another worldwide partner, Otto Bock, a German company that's specialist in, uh, in prostheses and wheelchairs and and, and plastic produ plastics production. And then we have two international partners. Uh, one is BP, and the second one is Allianz, the, uh, the, the big German uh, insurance company. And, uh, and so we've got some good sponsors. We've just acquired a new one, and most certainly we're going for new sponsors. I mean, I'm not going to say with which companies we're talking with at the moment. Uh, there will hopefully be announcements in the future. But, um, but, uh, but that's the situation. And I'm absolutely sure that the, that the sports marketing uh, arena, if we can call it that, is a very different place in the second decade of the 21st century than it was at the end of the 20th century. Corporate social responsibility, we've been told by Sir Martin Sorrell, does not exist in the Paralympic movement anymore. It's corporate social opportunity. It's an opportunity for com companies. Coming back to the question that was asked about the, Olympic, the, the Paralympics going in, into the Olympics, many of our sponsors have said, we want you to maintain your own identity, Paralympic movement. That's why we're partners with you. We partner with you for your values and for the sports performance of your athletes. So, Thank you both so much. Yeah, we're really, really honored to have you both here. Thank well, you. Great. Thank you. Loved it. Very inspiring. We have, we have a, uh, a tradition at the club right. to, for honorary membership for one year. Sir Philip, there you go. And... Thank you very so much. So please Thank both come to the club again. Come to the sushi bar. Right? <laughs> come to the sushi bar. The sushi bar. Okay. Yeah, Thank you so nice much. Sushi. And um, could everybody please remain seated? Um, they've got a, a you've got a big schedule ahead, and we're going to go out first for them, oh, okay. and then afterwards. Okay. You could leave. See you again soon. See you. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine.